So good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to all of you. My name is Dr. Ali Bridgenov Channin, and I will be hosting this webinar today that's very kindly been organized by the alumni team at King's. Um, so I'm an academic in work psychology at the Business School. I'm also the deputy director for our Masters in Public Policy and Management. I'm very interested in leadership because I teach and research in this area. So I'm really pleased that we're going to be hearing from Kay Swinburne this morning um, and her leadership experiences. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping. Today's webinar will be um, a 20 minute long presentation and then we will open it up to the audience for Q&A. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, our guest speaker today is Dr. Kay Swinburne, uh, Vice Chair of Financial Services at KPMG here in the UK. Um, just a bit of background on Kay. Like us, she graduated from King's with a degree in biochemistry and microbiology. Um, and she has a PhD in medical biochemistry from King's as well. Um, Kay also has an MBA from University of Surrey. Um, she's had a really fascinating and wide ranging career. Um, across a number of different sectors from international healthcare, investment banking, financial services and politics. Um, to the latter, Kay has served as an MEP from 2009 to 2019 um, and was vice, as vice chair of the European Parliament's Influential Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee. Um, as such, Kay has played a pivotal role in shaping EU and global financial services legislation. Um, in 2016, Kay was recognised as one of the most influential women in finance by Financial News. So in today's webinar, Kay is going to be discussing her leadership experiences and lessons that she's learned through this very multifaceted career across the sectors I've just talked about. Um, I think she's going to be exploring opportunities and challenges of leadership across different sectors and hopefully share advice for current and future business leaders who are going to be navigating similarly diverse careers. Um, and I think Kay's also going to be focusing a little bit on the impact of the current pandemic. So during Kay's presentation, those of you who are joining us on Zoom will be able to use the Q&A function on this platform to submit your questions online. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. Um, and when you open it, you'll be able to write questions, but also see everybody else's questions. We're really pleased that we've had such a good turnout today. Because of that though, we may not be able to answer all of your questions. So what we'd encourage you to do is to participate by looking at the questions that are out there um, and upvoting those questions that you would like to hear answered in the Q&A sections. Those that receive the most likes will be the ones that appear at the top, so you won't see them in chronological order, order but we'll select the ones that are most like to ask Kay in the discussion. So please join me in giving a really warm welcome to Kay Swinburne for this morning's discussion. Kay, over to you. Thank you very much, Alexandra, and thank you to King's for inviting me back. Um, it's not often you get to come back to, to your old college and actually talk. And in this case, for me, it's a very different department to the one I left um, when I was a King's student, both for my undergraduate and my postgraduate degree. I was obviously a science based student and part of, I guess, the, the geeky club uh, of people who actually spend a lot of time in labs. And, and didn't really do much thinking about, you know, the interaction of people and the way that things work. I was much more interested in the way that my kidney cells were growing rather than actually who was leading me and how they were doing it. So it's been an interesting journey for me. And, you know, as, as was just said, I actually am now the vice chair of KPMG in London. And within that organization of 17,000 people, there are seven vice chairs and I lead on the financial services section of their business, which makes up about one third of their profits. So a very significant part of their business. But the journey I've come on to get there has not been the usual KPMG vice chair journey. And of all of those vice chairs in the room with me, only two of us have come from an indirect route. The rest have actually all come from within the firm. And many of them have been there for decades. And so, you know, my first introduction um, at a vice chair's dinner, the week before I joined, when the, the dinner was hosted, lovely surroundings, private dining room in KPMG. They do that quite nicely when we're allowed to all meet. And I was taken and, and hosted for this dinner with, to get to know my fellow vice chairs. And there's one vice chair who was saying, you know, that he'd been at the firm for 30 odd years and that he was what he called a lifer at KPMG. 
And we were talking and he said, well, you know, I actually went in on a graduate recruitment program in 1988, at which point my ears pricked up. And I thought 1988, that was the year I graduated. And then I think back to the graduate milk round and the graduate uh, recruitment programs that all the big firms actually had in place. I applied to the big four firms in 1988 and actually didn't make the cut, didn't even make the interview stage on the basis that um, they didn't want a scientist, they didn't want uh, somebody from particular universities or particular backgrounds. So having come from a state school, having you know, sort of okay A-levels, but not brilliant A-levels, and then having come to university and flourished, it obviously wasn't Oxford, Cambridge, or any of the others, but I thought King's was pretty decent, to be fair. I thought it was up there, and certainly in science. At the time, it was one of the top universities in the country, which is why I'd chosen it. So I was a little put out, I guess, when I was you know, 21 and being rejected on the basis of not even making the first interviews. But all these years later, sitting around a dinner table, talking to somebody who'd made the cut that year, and actually had gone to that firm and stayed with the same firm for all those years, doing a series of slightly different jobs, but not that different all the way through those decades. And then we were sitting at the dinner table together in the same position, with the same responsibilities, with a vision for the firm and how to take the firm forwards. And it was fascinating because I don't regret a thing. I don't actually regret not making that graduate recruitment cut in 1988 because the journey I've been on and the things I've learned on that journey have been so important. And I think what it now gives me is a much different lens to look through things at. And I don't have a single lens anymore. I've got multiple lenses that I look through when I've got a business problem to solve. And so within the firm, I've been at KPMG since 2019, and I tend now to be the problem solver for most of the business. So they tend to bring me when they've got a problem, they don't know how to deal with it. And then they come to me to try and actually have some of that non-linear thinking, some of the, you know, sort of looking at it from a different perspective to come up with different solutions that some of those who've been in the firm for a lifetime might not have the skill sets to do. So actually, I don't regret a thing. So first note here is that when things knock you back, there are always other doors to open. And and certainly throughout my life, the big key for me has been knowing when the doors are open and actually having the courage to go through them. Because sometimes making those changes are really, really difficult. So my easy route, of course, when I I got knocked back from my graduate recruitment, I ended up uh, being offered a PhD in my laboratory that I had done a summer studentship in. And I absolutely loved the people I worked with, had an amazing time during my PhD, very fortunate that it worked. So I had one of the fastest PhDs um, that had happened at King's Life Sciences at the time, and I actually finished my PhD within three years. So by the time I was 24, now have two degrees under my belt and was ready to absolutely face the world. Thought I was going to run a pharmaceutical company. That was my vision. I'd met Lord Digby Jones uh, at an event when I was a student an undergraduate and thought, I want your job. And so out I went into the big wide world of pharmaceuticals. And little did I know that large corporations and graduate intakes are really tough. Even when you've got a PhD and you've been recruited for a specific purpose within the firm, it's still really tough to get known and to be seen when you're actually at a very large firm in a very, very junior position. My frustration lasted a number of years before I decided do you know what? I actually want to look for a job that allows me to use my skills now, not in 20 years time. I want to be able to demonstrate that I can do things and make a difference today, not in a decade's time. And so I went and, and researched and was very fortunate. I had a number of people around me who worked in the city of London at the time. And the city at that point was actually now employing a large number of science graduates. They were employing people from different backgrounds because they wanted scientists and people who understood the way that the financial markets worked and the way that the the stock market actually interacts with the companies that they're actually measuring performance of. So I became a pharmaceutical analyst. So I combined my scientific knowledge, so all that knowledge of the pharmaceutical pipelines, 
and all of the comparative knowledge of what the different firms were doing. Combine that with a very basic knowledge at the time of financial services and finance. But finance is all about modeling. It's all about Excel spreadsheets. It's all about applying what you already do as a scientist in a very different context. But it meant that I was the first person in the city at the time who had a PhD in medical research, who understood the science behind the companies that we were investing in, which meant that, yes, I was a square peg in a round hole. Once again, I was very different. And, and, you know, it shows through all the time you do things differently. But the reality was that I could actually go and have dinner with all the chief scientific officers of the global pharmaceutical companies. And scientists talk to scientists in a way that they don't talk to bankers. So you can sit over dinner talking the most geeky talk about all the research that's going on. Talk about the firms that they admire and, and which other drugs that they really think are going to make it and what has the benefit for society as a whole, and talking very generally. I learned so much from those chief scientific officers and having the privilege of sitting with them over dinner, listening to their passions about what drugs were going to make a difference in society. But I could come back and then use that in my modeling. I could come back and do comparative analysis of which drugs were likely to make it through when I've got some serious scientific sort of expertise giving me advice informally, but giving me advice nevertheless. So one of the lessons there is to actually learn to use the skills you've got and not to think that there are boundaries. So nobody said I couldn't go and speak to the scientific officer. The poor scientific officers had never spoken to analysts before on the basis that the analysts didn't understand what they were saying. So, you know, break new ground, do things, be brave. And actually, if people don't tell you you can't do things, then do it, try it. You know, push those boundaries, see how far you can go. And if you've got the skills and you've got the ability, then people are usually willing to help. So if you ask for help, people usually give it to you. So I'm actually always amazed at that that is a real truism. And, you know, some of these statements that my grandmother used to make are there for a reason. They actually are true. And so if you ask for help, usually you'll get some form of help back. And if people aren't prepared to give it, find someone else who will. So for me, science was my grounding and science was my first step into financial services. And I moved from the, the basic analyst role and, and got several years under my belt before doing mergers and acquisitions. Probably my favorite job ever. It's probably the one that has the most adrenaline rushes, the, the most unstructured because everything goes wrong. So you're in a, a pressured environment. You've got legal teams working through the night. You've got investment banking teams working through the night. And you have to somehow, as the relationship manager, keep it all together. You've got to be the swan that actually is gliding on the surface whilst everything underneath is, is paddling furiously beneath you. And so that, for me, was the combination of the excitement and the adrenaline of getting things done, working to very, very tight deadlines, but also then actually having the privilege of bringing two companies together and seeing that actually work out in the end. So one of the, the companies that I did in my, my early mergers and acquisitions days was to bring Sandoz and Siba Geigy, two Swiss companies together, to form Novartis, which became at the time the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, and actually, at the time, was the largest merger that had ever taken place. And so, you know, there are big things that happen when you actually dream small. So you can actually just sort of think about your daily life, bring things together to say, do you know, these two companies work together. And then you see it through to fruition and you end up with this enormous global company that really did fit together. And actually, the sum of the parts was definitely more than the individual firms were. So after doing pharmaceuticals and investment banking, tried my hand in the markets. And I can tell you, I was asked to, to talk about some of the things that work and some of the things that don't work. So hedge funds were the real key thing back in, in the late 90s when everybody was starting a hedge fund who could. And I was offered uh, very generously by some of the people I've worked with in investment banking, the seed funding for a hedge fund if I would uh, be the person responsible for stock picking in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology sector using my knowledge of, of the science. And so I jumped at the chance of doing something completely different. But little did I know that the skills you need and the temperament you need to trade in the financial markets 
to actually physically watch those stocks go up and down and therefore your P&L and your future go up and down on a daily basis is something I am not cut out for. I genuinely admire those traders who do this every day, who can live with that pressure, who can live with that responsibility, but it's not me. And I think one of the biggest lessons for me in life is to actually realize when it's not right, you need to do something about it. And so after two years in a hedge fund, through one of the worst turmoils in the technology markets in living memory, I decided enough was enough. And that the stress that I used to thrive on in investment banking and mergers and acquisitions was suddenly a negative stress rather than a positive one. And therefore, for me, it was time for me to actually take a break. And I, by the time I had two children, two lovely, adorable children, and I used to take them to nursery in the morning and I used to see them in the evening to, to say goodnight to. And I used to work really, really hard. So I thought time for a career break. Took a career break. At least I thought I was taking six years of being perfect stay at home mum. That was my intention. Little did I know that other people had made uh, markets, a lot of financial traders involved, had made markets and how long I would stay away from the workplace. Um, I thought it was going to be six years. It ended up being six weeks before I got extremely frustrated at my local town hall who were trying to put a stainless steel lift on a medieval building that all the tourists used to come to town to see. And I thought, well, why would you do that? Why would you put a stainless steel lift on the outside of a medieval building? So I went to inquire, because I now had time to inquire, of the local town clerk what was going on. And she just laughed and said, well, we have a, a disability access issue. Well, we have to, because of European law, have got to actually get the, the building accessible. This is a, a two-story building, but it's a market house, nothing underneath, only one room on the top. I said, well, what do you use the building for? She said, well, council meetings once a month. I said, so how many disabled people have ever asked to come in and, and haven't been able to access the meeting? She said, no one. And I said, well, can you keep a register? And then you'd know if people needed to have access. She said, we do. And nobody's ever asked for access. So I said, do you have an alternative room? She said, well, yes, we've got the council rooms. If we needed to use disabled access rooms, we could. So I said, well, it doesn't make any sense. And she said, no, but you have to be a councillor to make a difference, to change things. You have to have a vote. So I got myself co-opted to the local council within six weeks of getting up work. Within six months, I was the town mayor. And I can safely say one of my proudest achievements is there is no stainless steel lift on that medieval building. But we do have disabled access for our town council offices so that if we do need to have meetings in there, they can have them in that building. So sometimes just putting your skills to use, and I use my network of lawyers in London to help me actually get make sure we were covered legally and everything was above board. But finding alternative solutions is something that I pride myself in. And it doesn't matter if that's in my workplace or if it's in my public civic duty where I feel that I can actually contribute to my local community. But that was a slippery slope. So starting as a town councillor and town mayor, I met one David Cameron, who basically persuaded me that it was time for me to step into national politics. So when I was given the choice of doing Westminster or doing the MEP's role in Brussels, for me, the things I cared about were scientific policy and where that was heading, particularly with genomics and human biology and the, all the ethics surrounding that. And for me, that was really an important driver, but also financial services, which was my lifeblood. It's what I'd done for, for decades at that point. And so where did the policy get made or did the policy get made um, back in, in 2007, 8, but in Brussels? So Brussels was responsible for all scientific policy decisions and was responsible for, and the biggest budget, by the way, as well. So in terms of, of an 80 billion budget for Horizon 2020. And also they were responsible for all financial services legislation. So I ended up taking up the, the candidate's position uh, for David Cameron for Brussels in 2009 election. And I'm Welsh and very proudly Welsh speaking and decided that if I was going to represent any area, it was going to be my home country, my home nation. 
And so I actually stood for Wales for the Conservatives. And many people will say, why did you do that? That wasn't the safest of seats. Well, it's not the safest of seats, but actually, because I really do believe passionately in, in representing my country, I managed to, to get parts of Wales, particularly West Wales, where I come from, to actually vote for me. And, and as I put it, lend me their votes so that they had a local girl who actually really understood the rural communities that they actually represented. So I topped the polls in 2009 as a Conservative in Wales. Never been done before and probably won't be done ever again. But it is a PR system. So lots of things going for a PR system in that regard. But actually what it did was give me confidence to go to Brussels, knowing that the people of Wales trusted me, knowing that I had their faith to actually do the right thing for them. And finally, it was me being able to give back. It was my version of, of public duty, public service. But I ended up becoming um, fairly involved in financial services legislation during that period. Sadly, I didn't do anywhere near as much science as I would have liked. Um, I used to be an advisor to my colleagues rather than doing it directly. But there was a financial crisis of 2008, which ended up meaning in 2009, Brussels had to try and sort out the legislative framework for the entire financial services for the EU. So I led that initiative as one of the coordinators of the, the inquiry for the crisis and then the actual resultant legislative packages that came from it. So I spent a 10 year period immersed in financial legislation. But what I received during that time, I used all my skills that I'd already developed, but what I actually have managed to come out of that with is an extremely broad network, an extremely, yeah, very colorful black book, as it were, in, in old fashioned parlance. It's now all on, online and it's all in, in lovely Excel spreadsheets, but the reality is that my network is, is very extensive. And yes, I've kept in touch with some of my science people, I've kept in touch with my finance people, but during the political window, that really has been where the depth and breadth of relationships has really been quite amazing. And now in my new job, I actually find that it's the network that I use on a daily basis. It's you know, being able to call up people either in, in Brussels or in various member states or in the UK government or elsewhere within the system. All the people who came to lobby me within financial services, all the people who came to talk to me about various laws they wanted to shape in Brussels. I have all of them now as an extensive network. So when I'm trying to do things within KPMG and we are looking at, at the leveling up agenda within KPMG and how we can play our part so I don't just do the FS side, I also do some of the big public sort of interaction work that we do. And I use that network extensively every day. So for me, it's really important for people to actually realize that just those day-to-day -day contacts, you're making relationships that last. And if you then use them, if you pick up the phone, and if you do the same the other way around, you'll find that you end up with this wealth of knowledge at your fingertips. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know somebody who does. And then it's actually really helpful. You could always then actually find extra people to do some thinking for you when you've got a problem you're trying to solve. So my journey has been different. It's not been linear by any stretch of any imagination. But I actually, what I've done on each part of the journey is maxed out the opportunity. So really immersed myself in it, really taken the opportunity to train also the people around me. So I never employed in the parliament anybody who had a financial services background. But by the time they'd worked in my office for a year, they were absolutely expert in their field. They used to absorb information like sponges and were absolutely brilliant at then using that information to good purpose. So I think, you know, when you are in a position to lead, when you're in a position to teach, you need to continue doing that. You need to ensure that the knowledge that you've got inside of you actually gets passed on daily, that you don't just retain it, that you share it. And that, you know, people around you are desperate to actually understand why you've made the decision you have, how you came to that conclusion. One of the things I do at KPMG is a lot of mentoring. And I do what we call dual pen, where I actually sort of am responsible for the assessments and, and progression of certain key partners within the firm. I love it. 
absolutely love being able to say to them, okay, these are the things you do well. These are the things people tell me that you need to work on. Let's work on them. Why do you think that these are a problem? Being able to talk through and help people and take their weaknesses as being the problem I have to solve and help them come up with a plan for it is such a positive reinforcing thing. But actually that collegiate building teams attitude is one that I love. And I know I enjoy that finding camaraderie, doing the team building, actually being part of something bigger. It's something that drives me. And I think it's really important that when you've done certain things in life that you know are not right for you. So my hedge fund days and the market still give me an absolute cold sweat. But the reality is you then move on and find something that fits you and that you feel you give something to you know, everyone around you. And more importantly, you feel at peace and at ease with yourself. So you have that confidence. And that confidence from within ends up helping everybody else around you. So leadership for me is about feeling that I have got skills that other people appreciate and that I can actually share much of that with the people around me. And leadership for me is about being part of a team. It it may be the fact that I have a fancy title of vice chair, but I'm part of the team at KPMG. I roll my sleeves up when I need to roll my sleeves up. I've done many a a very, very late night when we've had a client deadline and I stay with the team working that through rather than actually just sort of waking up in the morning nice and fresh and then having everybody else sort of having worked through the night. So, you know, for me, it's being part of a team leading it is getting my hands dirty. It's not for everybody, but it's what really, really makes me tick. And it's where I get my daily satisfaction from. So... I'm going to stop there, Alexandra. I've probably talked too long, as I always do. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Kay, for sharing with the alumni community these insights into your career. We've already had a comment in the chat saying how inspiring this is. So I really appreciate that. Why don't we open it up to some questions now from the audience? We've had a few come in, so I will will filter those and and pass them to you. Um, So one of the first questions we had was, how did you build your financial knowledge without having the academic background, which allowed you to move into that sector? So I think it's it's important that you find people around you who really do have that knowledge and that you can learn from. So what I described there as being that other people that I've employed within the parliament's team <clears throat> as being sponges and, and just wanting to absorb the information, <clears throat> that was me. I, I, when I joined financial services, when I went into the bank, I was desperately wanting to learn about every aspect of banking. I wanted to understand about economics, I wanted to understand about the monetary policy, I wanted to understand all about the, the things that actually affect the, the stock market price of a pharmaceutical company. And, you know, you can't do that overnight. It, it is by osmosis. You're, you're surrounded by smart people. And you just have to find the people that will share. And you do. And, you know, yes, you read books, but books only take you so far. You know, you get background information from books. You don't get that that feeling of excitement and, and the enthusiasm that they have for their subjects unless you're talking to the practitioners, the people who are actually doing it day to day. So absorb it from people around you. Do the background reading, but, you know, go challenge the people that are doing the job. And actually check that what you've read is actually what really happens in the you know the workplace. Because often, I mean, the corporate finance books that I read before I, I did the job, and then having done the job, they don't bear any resemblance to it. So I think it's really important that you know people around you is the best way of learning. I think that leads on really nicely to a question that's been um, upvoted a few times, but. You know, you, you talk about the importance of people and the network. And so somebody's asked, what are the best ways to build your network and your contacts when you don't have that ready access to connections? Can you give any tips, Kay? So I think you'll probably find you're already underestimating your network if you think that. So, you know, within Kings, I have to tell you, you have got a community already around you. So, you know, whether it's, it's as an alumni or as an existing student, you already have a network. And all of your lecturers, all of the people you interact with, the people that you actually have contact with in a normal non-COVID way, um, you know, when you're actually there, have a coffee with your lecturer who's had an interesting career, who's not been the academic, who's been out in industry, who's done stuff, 
because their network becomes your network. And so when you're starting out, you may think you don't have a network, but people around you that you value and people around you that you work with do. And so, you know, I've got kids of, of you know, my children now are actually 20, 21, both the university. And they always say, you know, oh, your LinkedIn is so huge and you've got so many people to rely on. My comment to them is, but actually my network is not a real network in terms of LinkedIn. Yes, it's got 10,000 people as part of it, but I don't know those 10,000 people. My real network is actually probably a few hundred people that over decades have been there and I've built upon their networks and been introduced to people. You'll find the people that help you. You'll find the people you click with and actually keep them in your network. You know, work your network. I don't mean that in a, in a derogative way. I mean that in terms of keep in touch with people. And even if it's been a big gap, you know, if they're a real person in your network, they won't mind the fact you've gone silent for a while and they will love the fact you've reached out to them when you need them. Brilliant. Thank you. And I think it's that point you made about give and take as well. So there's a question that's been asked in a couple of different ways, but has the same sort of underlying message. So um, have you sort of ever sort of doubted yourself or felt insecure, given that you've been in these different sectors? You know, you've had to make changes. Do you ever sort of have any self-doubt? Every day. Absolutely every day. And, and the reality is that, that I have what I call my work front. So I will actually, it's, it's almost, it's putting on some makeup, doing my hair, and, and in normal days, putting on the heels um, and, and going out and just feeling empowered. And, and it's almost, it's my, my disguise. It's, it's, I'm taking on a persona and I do that every day. And, and I don't know many people, certainly my female colleagues who don't do that. I mean, I genuinely every day doubt myself and every day have to convince myself that actually I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm, I'm talking about. And, you know, the thing that terrifies me most is something like today, where it's, it's about me as opposed to about what I know. And um, I take confidence in knowing my stuff. I, I'm probably the most prepared person when it comes to a work presentation. I'll have done the homework. And when I put a, a merger and acquisition together or a piece of legislation, I've got a plan A, B, C, and D. You know, if the first one doesn't work and I can't negotiate it, I go to the second, the third, the fourth layer. But I've done all that prep. And so I have confidence that I, I have done the work and I'm therefore prepared. Something like this, you can't prepare for. It's very different when you have to talk about yourself. And I feel, you know, this this is me having to show vulnerabilities, whereas normally I've got the, the disguise on and, and you wouldn't see that. But every day. Brilliant. Thank you. A question from Hannah. How did you go from your first managerial role to your first leadership role? Um, she says, I'm here at the moment and struggling to change my identity and behaviour. So I have to say, I didn't do that transition very well. I always used to rebel against the system. I've always wanted to run rather than walk. So, uh, you know, being sort of in, in a junior management position for me was the most frustrating thing ever. So changing my role was what I did. And, and so I'm not a good example of how you do that. Um, so when I was getting frustrated in the research team and, and managing a research team, I jumped to mergers and acquisitions because it's much more fly by the seat of your pants and you're, you're kind of, you are the expert and therefore it's your deal and, and it becomes about you rather than about the structure. So that took me out of that sort of direct team management at, at, at a lower level and took me into a much more dynamic team management and leadership role straight away. So I've, I've always looked for roles that allow me to be different and allow me to have, I guess what my mother describes is that I, I get given my head, that, that it's like a horse needing to go. I just need to get on with it. And so the normal constraints are quite difficult for me. So I'm not a good example of, of that transition. Um, I've avoided it. <clears throat> and find ways around that problem. Um, others I know who do it very, very well um, have, it's it's being able to be seen to be doing the right thing at the right time, with the right people. And that's a skill set in of itself and, and not one that I'm particularly good at. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, another couple of questions which have, again, a similar underlying theme. So I'll, I'll sort of package them up if you like. But 
Um, Anupath has asked, your description of wanting to soak up information is something I find myself doing whenever I start a new job role, um, even if it's not a new career direction. And this leads to me failing to strike a good work-life balance every time. Um, that question is, do you have advice for the workaholics amongst us? And there's another <coughs> question. No. <laughs> Um, I, I would take the opposite position. I think if it's what drives you, if it's what makes you who you are, don't fight it. So you need to, to make sure the people around you, the people that you care about, understand what it is that drives you. And, and if you know there are things you do need to change in terms of small changes, make them for you know people that you love and care about. And but for me, I just I needed to be able to do that. And I still do. You know, I mean, if somebody told me when my kids were born that I, I wasn't allowed to work, a piece of legislation that I was asked to vote on in Brussels when I was an MEP was um, compulsory maternity leave for women in Europe. And, and I literally passionately argued that you couldn't do that to women. How could you force women to have a year off work? You know, even if you're going to compensate them financially, that doesn't give certain women what they need from life and what they they really sort of what gives them their energy and and what gives me my energy so for me it's and, and my kids understand that you know they they laugh because they know I sit at my desk for 12 hours a day and you know they'll call me up at, at eight o'clock at night and say I've got another piece of work for you can you check this essay for me you know it's it, they know that that drives me and just embrace it if you absorb information you enjoy it just just take it that it's part of you. I mean, I don't have a very good work-life balance, but actually I enjoy reading work-related stuff. So rather than reading a novel, I will pick up a, you know, an Economist article or I'll pick up you know, a, a speech by the governor of the Bank of England. I am that sad person. But actually I don't, I don't actually think of that as work. That's actually what I enjoy doing. And sometimes you can be a geek and people around you understand it. So it's about aligning with your passions. Um, so we've got a question from Kate Woods, who heads up our career service. She said, in the career service, we meet some PhD students who feel boxed in by their research and can't see the value outside of academia. What's the top tip for them to understand the powerful skills they have acquired, or they've acquired during their research? So I think it's important when you're doing your PhD, you're so focused on a very tiny bit of the universe that, that you're almost down a tunnel and don't see the big wide world. And, and I know when I came out of my PhD, it, you, you're so focused on the results of your specific project that it's difficult to see the big wide world around you. Sit down and write a list of all the skills you think you've got. And actually, if your list isn't very long, the people who know you best, ask them to write a list for you of what they think your skills are, because sometimes you don't see the obvious and, and you wouldn't put them down as a skill. So just make sure you've got that thought process that you've been through, almost a checklist of the things you have, because then you, you're confident to then go and talk to other people in other sectors about what you bring to the table. And, you know, I, I have to say, as a scientist, non-scientists don't understand the scientific training. But my colleagues, I can tell you, in certainly in, in Brussels over the last 10 years, understand that I have scientific methodology behind everything that I do. I am incredibly methodical in the way I approach a problem. I, I have, you know, sort of my hypotheses, I have my methodology for testing it. And then I'm also prepared that if it hasn't worked, to go back to the beginning and do it again. And, and it's that scientific rigor that actually makes me, I think, good at my job. So, you know, would anybody have said to me, you know, a scientist makes a good financier, a scientist makes a good, you know, politician, probably not. But actually, yes, because the rigor that you apply to scientific endeavor is something that actually carries you in good stead the rest of your life. And that training, that logical thought process is something that actually is probably my greatest skill. So, you know, you just need to sit down with a, a plain sheet of paper and start writing that list of all your skills. And as I say, use others. If you haven't got a long enough list, use others to actually come up with it and supplement it. Yeah, 
brilliant, thank you. Um, something I'm interested in as well, this question, um, you've obviously got a passion for science. So what drove you to sort of, although you keep it in your career, what drove you sort of away from just a pure scientific career? I think just realizing how big the world was out there. So for me, financial services was a way of, of getting to see the best of science and being able to look at it from a very different perspective. So funding science for me was a really big thing. So the capital markets, I mean, it's not all about share prices. It's about who funds the investors who buy the stock long term to actually allow the company to have the funds to do the research. So it's, it's facilitating that research process. So when you see it from that perspective, it's actually not about finance. It's about helping biotechnology firms, helping pharmaceutical firms getting the funding to continue their research. And the vast majority of the funds that they raise in the capital markets go to that research, the, the blue sky research in particular. So it's important to, to see it from that role. So science was, was financial services for me. It was all about my science. It was all about the biotechnology and the pharmaceutical sector and how I helped them get funding to be able to do what they did best. Then, you know, moving into to policy and, and legislation, I, you know, I ended up, because there was a financial crisis, doing financial services legislation. So I've, I've had to abandon my science, as it were, for 10 years. And that saddened me more than anything else, because I genuinely, it's the first time in 2009 that science wasn't the core of everything that I did. And suddenly not reading all of the research articles, not really understanding. So I ended up um, being a judge of the Europa Bio Awards. So every year in, in uh, Europe, they actually host a, a, a ceremony and, and a competition for the most innovative biotech firm. And so every year I would take two weeks off work and I would read the applications, which would be a big tomb of papers all you know, state-of-the-art sort of biotech firms. And in order for me to understand what they were saying, I'd often have to go and do a whole load of other reading in order to actually catch up to, to make sure I hadn't missed that. So I would do that every year. And one of my other former, former MAPs um, was also a former scientist, and he would do it with me. And the two of us would be the, the sort of the, the lay people, as it were, doing the judging. And the other judges were all private equity guys. So they did this for a living. They make decisions on these companies for a living, day in, day out. They're at the, the top of their game. And we would, it was always the hardest thing I used to do. You'd have a table of, of 20 criterion, and you'd have to mark each of those companies across all of those criterion. And then you didn't talk about it. You had to submit your paper. That was the worst day where you submit that. Because if you think something's brilliant and the experts think it's absolutely awful, suddenly you think, oh, my God, I've lost it. So that used to be my, my, my real science. Every year I'd make sure I got immersed back in it for a short period, but, but it was my fix. And I also um, sat on, on the scientific um, task force in Brussels. So a few scientists, even though we weren't doing it as legislative files, we would sit as advisors to the rest of the parliament and, and would be used as that senior advisor network. And, and that I enjoyed. And a couple of those projects, they asked me to, to head up. So I'd, I'd go and immerse myself in a certain project for a certain length of time and, and sort of effectively take my summer to do something specific. So I still miss it. I, I still seriously miss it. Um, and at the moment, I'm trying to work out at KPMG how I might get to work with some of the science companies. Um, I haven't yet, but I'm, I'm desperately seeking opportunities to go and, go and work with some of, of it. my heart's always there. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, since we're on KPMG, maybe I'll just ask you a question about that. And you talked about how your, I suppose, different background is valued because you bring a different perspective. Um, and obviously that's something we see a lot of the same kinds of people coming from the same universities. How do you start to change that culture in these big organisations? Are you doing anything particularly to help with that? So I've chosen KPMG deliberately because it's a firm that actually wants to change and has been changing. So it has a change agenda and it's had a change agenda for at least 10 years. So it's, it's on a journey as opposed to starting it. So for me, um, and, and the chairman currently, he's also not your traditional chairman. 
Um, he's Australian. He's a straight talker. I mean, he's he's not your typical sort of you know English public school person. He really isn't, and and I love that in him because he also sees the world slightly differently and and wants to make the world a better place. Mm-hmm. So I I think I found a kindred spirit, and for me, he calls me his disruptor. So I'm employed to to think differently. I'm employed to bring the different outlook to any problem that they have. And I'm, I've been brought in to challenge. So using all of the knowledge I have and all of the different uh, skills I have, my role is to challenge the status quo. So, you know, everybody will come to me and, and say, you know, this is the way we do it. It's like, why? And it's like, because that's the KPMG way. It's like, I can't believe you've said there's a KPMG way. Really? I mean, there can't be a KPMG way. Every client has got different needs. Every client's got a different solution you need to give them. Therefore, that's not the right answer. We need to go back to what is the problem we're solving for and what is it the client actually needs as an outcome and and take it to a client lens rather than this is what KPMG's got for you, this is what you're having. And I think some of the big four have taken that role. Yeah, it's almost because they're so big that what they say is true. And, and therefore, this is the tomb, this is the piece of work you need to know, and this will tell you everything you need to do. And it's so not true of modern companies. It's so not true even of those companies that are transforming and digitizing and you know, trying to reinvent themselves for the next generation. You know, we have to think differently. And COVID has been huge for us, absolutely enormous, because we're all out of the office. So the, the Canary Wharf office that I'm usually um, working in has got capacity for about six and a half thousand people. At any one day since March, we have not, um, since the original lockdown, we haven't had more than 500 people in the office. And that was on one day. The average number in the office has been 120. So it it genuinely has changed the way we work. And, you know, I, I was saying earlier, I never used to use my laptop. I used to be a people person. I would spend all my time in the office, networking, talking, and, and doing things. And now I'm doing it on a, on a laptop instead. But instead of doing three client meetings a day, because I'd have to travel between them, or God forbid I had to do a meeting in the States that would take me out for three days to go and do one client meeting, I could do seven or eight in a day now. And I can be in Australia, I can be in the US, I can be in Germany, I can be all over the place in one day. And so all the clients are happy because they're having conversations, you know, and, and having genuine, real interaction. But we can't lose this. So there is something that has happened that has allowed us to be more productive and allowed us to stop almost wasting that time of traveling and doing things for no necessary reason. So I think we have to now embrace this new work environment. But I don't think what I do can't be online permanently. I mean, it's a people person issue. For me, I get my energy from other people. So meeting other people, you know, interacting with them, actually learning the broader problems that they've got and putting it into context to go back and with a solution is, is, is part of who I am and what I do. And so that in, people interaction can be really important to maintain. But a lot of the other things I do, the routine mundane stuff, I'm replying to emails, I'm responding to a request more generally from people who just need a, you know, a quick reply from me. I can do from anywhere. I don't need to be in Canary Wharf, the most expensive real estate in the UK, to do that. I can actually do that for my home perfectly happily. So I can see a time when I can go back to the office and maybe do two or three days, probably more with clients, to be fair, not even in the office. So actually be at client sort of venues rather than in my office. And then a day networking with my clients, um, a day networking with my, my colleagues, and then actually the rest of the time I can do from anywhere. And I think we're rethinking that. We're looking at our real estate. We're looking at how we can turn our offices from these open plan, huge spaces that have got hundreds of people on them, very impersonal. I don't find them very conducive to work. And therefore, we're transforming those into collegiate collaborative spaces so that people go into the office to collaborate. People go into the office to actually work together, to get the energy from one another, to actually be able to do that, you know, sort of, uh, I think sort of the, the phrase that I always use is spiffballing, uh, where we actually just take a topic and then just think around the topic with lots of different people 
there's no wrong answer. There's no stupid answer. You just come up with anything that comes into your head and put it down on a whiteboard. And, and these days, the whiteboard's not a traditional whiteboard either. We've now got a, a brand new tech center that has all of these things that, you know, I can post post-its from home, post-it notes from home onto the whiteboard in the office in Canary Wharf. So, you know, things have transformed. We can't therefore miss the opportunity to do things differently. And, and I think genuinely, everybody should now be thinking that way. You know, this isn't about being in an office five days a week now. If you don't need to be there, you need to be thinking about how to best work. And that should also give you a better work-life balance. Because actually, no matter what, if you're at home for more hours rather than commuting, some of those days, it's got to actually improve that work-life balance too. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, another couple of questions uh, related to the same topic. So it's brilliant, Anita says, that you're so respected in the workplace. Congratulations. However, this is not the experience of women of colour. What have you done to ensure that the workplace is more diverse and inclusive for people of colour? So KPMG is one of those firms that has actually had a programme in place for over a decade. Um, we actually have um, a, a black network, which has been in place for many, many years. And we've just reinforced it as a result of the Black Lives Matter campaign um, earlier this year. So we went back and looked at, at what that group was doing and how it was achieving. But to be fair, we've done that across the whole of the entire network. So not just our Black colleagues, but our, our BAME colleagues more widely. And we've also gone to look, I mean, the, the gender stuff we still haven't fixed decades on. And, you know, I mean, when people sort of think that they've all those issues have gone, they haven't. They've gone in a number of companies, but they haven't gone in all companies and in all sectors. So there are still some big gender issues. Um, and we're not a minority. We're actually the majority of the population as women. And so, you know, it frustrates me that the majority of the population still can't get parity in the workplace. You know, there is something desperately wrong with that. So I think it's beholden on those of us who fought particularly for gender parity for the last few decades. And believe me, things are very different in the city now to when I worked in the city and started 30 years ago. You know, it's a very, very different world to the one that I entered. So I hope I've made it a slightly better place than when I actually went in. But I do it daily. I, I do various diversity programs. Um, I speak out an awful lot. I do a lot of mentoring. Um, we have a, a black mentoring scheme. So we understand that there are some big issues and, and that people don't feel valued in the way that they should. And everybody should come into work and feel valued. And so even if it's a perception rather than real, we need to ad address it. So we have got this big mentoring scheme that's going on. So every black colleague within our organization is paired with a, a partner for mentoring so that they have access to senior people to actually, if they have got issues, if there's anything that they feel that they want to raise, that they can have that. But more importantly, they've got somebody that can actually coach them through all of the difficult journeys that, that we have in, in corporate life. It's, it's important that everybody feels that they have that. But I think our Black colleagues, because they are still, and in our firm, the numbers are not good. They are not representative numbers. And so, you know, we have got um, some very strong recruitment policies in place. Um, our recruitment, to be fair, on a graduate level is really good. So we've actually managed to get some, some decent uh, recruitment, but we need to retain those staff and therefore we need to actually do more to actually work on it. But diversity is at the heart of, of KPMG. I mean, they really do take it very, very seriously. And it's not lip service, it's real. And for me, it's important, you know, we're part of the Hampton Alexandra sort of work um, place analysis that does all the, the gender stuff. I mean, I, I, I personally had a court case a number of years ago. I'm not even supposed to be able to talk about it, so I won't say any more. But, you know, challenging the system when it's not right is important. And you need to, when you have a voice, you need to use it. So for me, it's important that, that those of us in senior roles do. And those who feel they're not being listened to, you know, whatever, whether it's colour, creed or, or gender, they need to find somebody that they can go and talk to in a senior leadership position because most leaders in most modern firms would be absolutely mortified to know that that's how you're feeling and will do everything they can to try and make it better. Brilliant, thank you. I think we've got time for maybe just one more question. <laughs> so 
Um, which qualities, Kay, do you think are lacking among today's leaders? I think there are there are two camps of leaders that I come across, and, and bearing in mind most of my clients and the people I interact with are financial services. So financial services is typical. I mean, it, it, it still is at the top, very much a male-dominated, certain type of, of educated um, individual. So it's still very much the traditional old financial services, by and large. Not all together. I'm not tying them all the same way. But bearing in mind, I deal with those. There are two different types of leaders I come across in that financial services space. Those who genuinely are the old alpha male. Um, you know, I'm the leader. You do what I say. And, and it's very autocratic. Um, I would find it difficult to work for a firm that, that works that way. And then you've got the much more empathetic leaders, those who actually are much more collegiate, those who actually lead by example. And they're the leaders that I naturally migrate towards. It's the type of leader I've always wanted to be. And they're the people that I naturally would associate with. And I believe that they get more out of their staff. I believe they get more out of their clients. And I genuinely think people want to do business with them. So I think it's great for their shareholders too. So that for me is, is really important that, that, you know, if you're actually looking for a firm to join, look to the leadership style that is at the very top. Look at the way that those senior managers behave. And, you know, you see them on shareholders, you'll see the AGMs. You can you know, watch the videos. It's all now on video. You can do all of that research beforehand before you join a firm and, and think carefully about the type of leadership style that suits you and what you want to emulate. Because for me, it's important. I find yeah, somebody who actually wants to be a collegiate, empathetic leader, rather than almost an altruistic leader, rather than somebody who's actually just all about me, 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 and this is all about me and my bonus. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That brings the questions to a close. I just want to close the webinar with a huge thank you to Kay Swinburne today, who's kindly giving us her time. I really hope you found the, the webinar interesting. I can see there's already some thank yous in the chat. Um, if you've got any questions about anything that was shared today, really don't hesitate to get in touch with the alumni office. Um, you can email them at forever at kcl.ac.uk. And once again, Kay, a huge thank you for joining us today and for all of you for listening. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.